I sure. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Tough problem. Here we go. 13B, everybody. Um, yeah, what, what, what really makes this tough is you have to think in three dimensions. Hopefully you can make sense of my crude drawing. First of all, you have a, what, a prism with a, with a pyramid sitting on top of it. And they told you that the height of the pyramid was 4x. Let's see. I better just read it to make sure I get it straight. Yeah. Face of the cube. Cube is 6x on each side, and the pyramid has a height of 4x. Can you see where I'm pointing up there for 4x? Okay. Now, do you notice how that comes from the tip of the pyramid to the center of the top of the cube? Okay. So in three dimensions, do you see how I then completed that with a red triangle? And that red triangle, well, this is easy. This is half of the 6x. Of the 6X so I know this is 3x. And then this crazy thing that comes down in the center of the triangular face, I'm temporarily calling H. And so, that looks like this, 3x, 4x, and then it's h. And what I did over here is I calculated that with the Pythagorean theorem, that has to be 5x. So, you know, 4x squared plus 3x squared equals h squared. And then you're able to calculate what h is when you get all done it's 5x. Now, so all of that, just to find out that this red piece right here is 5x. Now, finally, what does this side of the pyramid look like? It looks like this. The triangle, I just calculated this 5x here. This is 6x. We're trying to find the area. So what do we do? Base times height divided by 2. Base times height divided by 2. 15x squared. How many of those are there on the pyramid? 1, 2, 3, 4. So I have to multiply that by 4. So now I, here's the, what, the surface area of the pyramid. And of course, these are put together so there is no bottom. You know what I mean? Just one piece. Now, what's the surface area of the cube? Well, each side is 6x by 6x. 36x squared. And aren't there 1, 2, 3, 4 going around and 1 on the bottom of 5? So 5 of those gives me 180x squared. And if I add those up, there's the total surface area of my obelisk. There's a lot of horse around to get the right dimension there. Now, can I plug any holes there? Sarah? Yeah, for the part of the rectangle of the figure, it doesn't have six sides, not five sides. Well, see. Oh, wait, no, the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. This wouldn't be there because yeah. these are fused okay. together. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, you're right. It is a temptation to count six sides on the cube. Normally there are, but because there's a pyramid welded onto it, we, we don't have that. Uh, before we go any further with questions, I forgot to tell you this last time. Two of the, especially two of the problems were stinkers. 33 and 35. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I was, I, for, I usually tell people ahead of time, and then what I do on today is I tell them I'm going to hand them out to them. Well, I didn't print them out, but you know how by every lesson I have up there, like notes from class, if you go choose that, this is there, and you can print this. So, Instead of me printing it, I thought, well, I'll give you the option. 
Anyway, why did I do it that way? Because this problem alone can take 30 minutes. Okay, and I really don't have 30 minutes to go through it today. But it's done in every bit of detail here. What I did is I did the circumference in this column, surface area in this column, and the volume in this column. 35 is like that too. And so 35 is up there. I think this is the bowling ball with three holes drilled out of it or whatever. Yeah, so that's up here too. I'm sorry, I should have warned you about those. They're kind of beastly. Yeah. Do you want that all in our notebook? It would be nice to have that complete. Okay. And so you're allowed in this case to print that page for those pages and just get them punched and you can just, just like insert it your notes. And then you got the assignment complete. Now, I suppose you could do that with a I've got all kinds of problems down here. I don't exactly want to open your notebook and see all my notes. Okay, but in that in the case of 33 and 35, yeah, just print them. Do you go over 25? Sure. Okay, looks like this is a new one. 25. Find the volume of a sphere of radius 6 inches. So volume of a sphere radius 6 inches. Okay, I believe I gave you this. two-thirds capital BH. Okay, now again, what does capital B mean? I guess, let me pull a sphere out here first. Hope I may not have one. Um, well, we'll just make this count. We'll make believe that's a sphere. And then um, within that, there is a a great circle, slice if you will, horizontal slice. And then um, now the radius would look something like this. Okay, so using my terminology, capital B is the area of this slice circle. And how do you find the area of a circle? Pi r squared. In this case, that's what? 36 times pi. So that would be, does everybody see that would be our capital B? Okay, now I'm supposed to take that times the height. Now you're probably wondering what in the world is the height of a sphere? Well, it's from, you know, this the height would be just this whole thing. And wouldn't that just be 12? So we have two-thirds, capital B, times the height. That should do it. Now we can simplify here. 3 goes into 36 12 times. 12 times 12 is 144. 144 times 2 is 288. So it looks like it should be 288 pi cubic inches. <clears throat> and again, uh, by the, you're going to notice that I love pi as part of the answer. Um, I actually prefer that. It's exact. Um, you don't need to multiply that out. That's 25. Anybody follow up or more detail on 25?
other questions. We can spend more time on this. Okay. All right, here's 31. I better read it, make sure I got it right. Popular sized can has uh, a three inch diameter, which I've tried to sketch up there. And it's four inches high. How many grams of water will one of these cans hold? And then they tell you in parentheses the key thing you got to know one cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. Or in inches, in cubic inches, it's uh, two. I guess we didn't need to know. Yeah. It, uh, one, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Okay. So, first of all, how do you find the volume of a, of a cylinder? Capital B H. What's capital B in a cylinder? Circular base, circle, pi r squared. So do you see how it becomes pi r squared times h? All right. What is r? Well, if the diameter is 3, isn't r 1 and a half? And then when you square 1 and a half, that's where I got the 2.25. So I plug it in, 2.25 times pi, times the height, 4, gives me 9 pi cubic inches. So there's the volume in cubic inches. Okay. Um, now, i got to do some conversions here, don't I? In order to get it in cubic centimeters, I need to multiply by 2.54 cubed. Why? Because in each linear inch, there are 2.54 centimeters. But this is cubic inches, so it's 2.54 times 2.54 times 2.54. Anyway, that will give you the answer in cubic centimeters. And once you know that, then what? Well, each cubic centimeter is a gram. So how many cubic centimeters you get? That's how many grams you have. And then you got it. So I didn't finish it off here. You can finish it off on your calculator. But so 9 times pi times 2.54 cubed will tell you how many cubic centimeters, and that's the same as how many grams. <coughs> And so we can arrive at what? The, uh, <clears throat> the mass of material inside the can. Can you yeah. actually go over seven? Sure. Okay, number seven. Six-sided polyhedron that's convex and is not a parallelopiped. You're supposed to make a sketch. Okay, a parallel pipe, it means it's not like a box. Okay. Six sides. So we could have I gotta think about how we're gonna draw this. I'm thinking top and a bottom and four sides. Mm -hmm. But I don't want all the sides to be parallel. I gotta just make sure parallel type it is on page five fifty-four. Yeah, they don't really tell you real well what a parallel pipe is, do they? They show you a rectangular one. So I don't know. I guess I'd go. Hmm. Like the top base could be smaller than the bottom base, then, and could be. Um. Yes. That's a good. I like that idea. And then just connect the points.
Yeah, and uh, by the way, the one I just drew, there's actually a name for that. It's called a frustum of a pyramid. But you, she just gave me a good clue. That never do we say the top and the bottom have to be the same size. I don't know if you can tell what I'm trying to draw. But it's like a pyramid that's been lopped off on the top. It's not a parallel pipe because these sides are not parallel. They're slanting in. Likewise, the front and the back. Um, I'm sure there are many different ones, but I guess they do want you to have a little, a little bit of, I want you to have just a little bit of skill in being able to draw 3D objects. Now, I'm assuming everybody's tried drawing a cube, right? We've all done that, I'm sure. Where you draw a couple, couple uh, squares. Uh, wait a second. And then just connect the appropriate uh, corners, vertices. The other thing you can do if you're using software is you can just pull a cube out. I notice I resisted from doing that. But anyway, I'm assuming everybody can do that, right? Yeah, no, the, here's uh, just a comment. There's a problem every time you draw a 3D object on 2D paper. It can be viewed at least two ways. Right? There's an optical illusion here. You can look at this with this part being the front. Try to take a few minutes and just get your eyes adjusted. Can you see how this part right here is toward you and then this is what the bottom you're looking up at? Okay. Now no, not everybody. I'm getting some strange looks. It does take a while. We almost got it. Okay, got it. Now, couldn't you also see this as the front? Are some of you still on the other one? Anyway, there is a shift that's involved, and it's not real easy. It's the problem is this has to get to be convinced. It's not real easy. Optical illusions often work that way. So anyway, <coughs> while I'd like you to be able to sketch like that, be aware that uh, there are some there are some ambiguities in the drawing sometimes. Um, Escher liked to play games with uh, optical illusions of 3D like that. I, I'm sure you have you seen his famous one of water flowing, flowing downhill and at the very end it winds up going up and you're like how did he pull that off? Where well, it goes down every step but it winds up higher. Yeah he's pretty good at playing games with that. And then he's got a guy in one of his paintings holding an impossible object. Um, where a post that's supposed to be in the back is in the front, and you're like, wow. yeah, he does that intentionally to get you to, to entertain you. <coughs> Other, so I forgot which one was this number seven. Yeah. Can you just go through the reasons for nine? Nine. If the, yes, I will. I'll be happy to. If the edges of a cube are doubled in length, what happens to the volume? Okay. Think of it this way. Let's just say our cube started off one by one by one. Volume, one by one by one is one. Okay, now double everything. And now you've got two times two times two, which is eight. What happened to our volume? It went from one to eight. So, and, and the explanation though is really what happened is it increased by two cubes. Because we jumped from one dimension to, uh, to three, we had to take that doubling and use it. And that's why it turned out to be. I forgot, what was the second part? Um, Area? It's, 
the length is tripled today. Okay, if the length is tripled, now instead of one by one by one, or a volume of one, now it's three by three by three, which is 27. And, or really it's three cubed. So it's that concept of, don't forget to cube something when you jump up three dimensions. Or jump two, three. Okay, well, there's a lot more up here. Um, I'll have to update this, but the rest of these, including these two wing dingers here, they just, they're just long. They're not hard. They're just long. Um, this was, what, a base, baseball, a soccer ball, and a basket? Yeah, sorry I can't talk. But anyway, you're supposed to compare all of those. Okay. I've got a two-part lesson for you today. It's, uh, I'm not going to be able to get this done in one day. So the plan is to do this red part today. This is all in the title in the book. This whole thing. Today we're going to take network non-Euclidean geometry and that's my goal. And then I'm going to save Monday kind of a special class where we actually do, I guess you could say, kind of like a lab activity on Monday. And then we'll cover topology. So today, networks. And uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of the uh, non-Euclidean geometry. <coughs> Okay, now you're going to think this is kind of silly, but this begins with an ancient problem uh, set in the little tiny German town of Königsberg in Germany in uh, the mid-1700s. There's a map of Königsberg in the center bottom. The blue stands for river. The red are bridge, bridges over the river. Okay. The um, the thing went like this. Couples for entertainment. You got to remember this is the mid 1700s. But for entertainment, they would go out go out for a walk after dinner. And the idea was, let's see if we can take a walk, cross every bridge exactly one time, and get back home. So you can't cross a bridge twice. You can only cross each one once. And that was kind of the challenge. Okay? Well, it turns out it can't be done. And finally, the German mathematician Euler, who you've heard of before, he did Euler diagrams. Remember that? Um, that's him in the bottom left. He discovered what it takes to do such a thing. Now you may think, well, what in the world are we doing looking at this in the, you know, 21st century? Well, it turns out it's the foundation for all kinds of networking issues. And I'm talking about, when I say networking, I'm talking about computer networks, I'm talking about telephone networks, I'm talking about even things like social networks, um, delivery routes for a company, any kind of system of paths. And that's why I have the picture on the right. Uh, I particularly like to think of electronic networks that are global. global. But uh, so it turns out that solving this old ancient problem has a lot to do with very important modern things. OK. So here's what Euler came up with. Well, in order to come up with it, I'm going to, I'll, I'll kind of develop it with you here. So I'm going to take a map in the book. You'll see this on page 564. Euler said, okay, I got four land masses. I have land mass A. I'm going to represent with a point, landmass D. Then I got some land up here. I'm going to call that C. And some land down here. I'm going to call that B. 
So uh, I know we, you're probably wondering, what are we doing with points? Well, those are just kind of like destinations. Okay. Now, in networks, we can connect these destinations. And they don't have to be with straight lines. They can just be any, any kind of an arc. Now, looking at the bridges in the, in the book, how many ways are there to get from landmass A to landmass B? Just look at the map in the book. Do you see that one on page 564 on the left there? How many ways are there to get from that island A down to B? Aren't there two ways? Because there's two bridges. So here's how I'm going to represent that. I'm going to have one path representing one way. And then I'm just going to draw another one from A to B that gets there a different way. Okay, I know you're wondering, well, I don't get what this drawing is. I'll show you and just, just hang on a second. How about from A up to C? How many ways? It's two again, isn't it? So we're going to draw that like this. Okay. Um, how about from A to D? Just only one way to do it directly, right? How about from C to D? One way, right? And B to D? Okay, that's called a network. Now, I know you're probably thinking that doesn't tell me anything. Here's what we're going to do. At each vertex, each point, count how many paths come to that point. Okay, here I see one, two, three. At point A, I've got what? One, two, three, four, five. Am I counting correctly? You get that? Okay, and up here, what do we have? Three. And at D, we have three. Okay. Now, I'm going to just, I'm, I'll be right back. I'm going to just scoot. Okay. Here's what Euler found out. In, uh, not Forget that up there right now. Just look down here. Euler find, found out that you can do this only when you either have zero or two odd vertices. Zero or two odd vertices. Now, if you go back to our problem, how many odd vertices do we have? Four. It's not zero, not two. Therefore, we say this can't be done. I mean, you could do it if you cheated across one bridge twice, but if you follow the rules, it can't be done. There's a word for this. If it can't be done, we call it traversable. If it can't be done, it's not traversable. Um, I'll write that up here. So this one is not traversable. And is it IBLE? No, it's ABLE. not traversable. And once again, Euler's, the big theorem, I should really put a rectangle around it, is right here. Euler discovered that a network is traversable when you have no odds or two odds. Any other combination, forget it. And what we'll do is we'll practice this on a whole bunch of networks. Now, again, this is a big deal. You might think, well, what's the big deal about crossing a bridge twice? Well, put it in terms of modern day. If you were running your own company, let's say, I don't know, let's say you own a dairy and you were delivering, you're delivering milk to several cities and to all kinds of different customers. You've got, let's say, eight trucks that you own. 
do you want your trucks? Do you want two trucks driving on the same street? Probably not. Wouldn't you like to have the truck that's going that direction deliver all the roads? And the truck that, you know, and then let's have a different truck do the other side of the city. You don't want duplication going on because you're paying for all of that care. And so you see why you don't want to double up? It makes sense. Likewise, if you're doing a computer connection, do you want computer communications having to go back and forth a couple times before they get to you? No, it's slowing down. So you want efficient, efficiency. And so this really is important modern day uh, technology. So I guess we should try some now. I got all this application in between. Um, so, why don't you open up your books for a minute, please, and um, look at page 565. I think I told you I'm recording, right, these classes? Did I tell you that? I am. I'm actually, uh, from the last three classes, I'm trying out a recording system where I'm recording the screen and the audio. And the idea is... Um, I want to make this, a, you know, and then it, instead of just seeing notes, you can actually kind of re-experience the class. This is going to be a real joke with this voice this time, but um, uh, you can, for example, you can either do the video iPod thing, or I also will be producing just the uh, audio stream. I don't know, just might help some of you out in case uh, you want to go over something again. But anyway, today is going to be pretty funny. You know, who is that guy quacking in the front? Um, so on page 565, you see those diagrams toward the bottom of the page? Those are networks. Okay. Do you, do you agree with the book that there are no odd vertices in that first drawing? Just quick run a count. Two, two, four, two, two. You see how there are no odds? Okay. So, question is that network A traversable? Yeah, because it was either what was it, zero or two odds. We'll do it. So, A is good to go. Now, I got to explain something about B. You're probably wondering what's going on at C and A. You can, <coughs> you can think about it like this. You're probably going, well, I don't even see any points. You can just take the two points right in there. And then just really does it. Two, two, three, 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 is this reversible? It has two odds. How about C? That, by the way, E doesn't end up anywhere, so that's just a count of one out there. Everything else is even except for E and A, right? So two odds, that should be traversable again. How about that last, that uh, part D? One, two, three, one, two, three. So it's four threes and a four. So four odd vertices, not traversable. And how about E? They say two odds. Is that legitimate? Which two vertices are odd? Which ones? Yeah. You probably said it right. I just didn't hear it. B and D is correct. Yeah. Okay. So one more time. What did Euler find out? If you have a network, any network that has zero or two odd vertices in it is traversable. Anything else? No. 
Now, what I've got is some, you think this network, I gave you some examples, computer networks. Here's a bunch of others that I just saw recently in a science magazine. This is a bacteria network. Um, here are some more metabolic networks. And you can tell they can get quite complicated. Uh, actually, if you looked at your nervous system, your nervous system is a network. It's just, it's, that's, so biologists are doing this all the time. Um, this is actually a computer program actually made this up, uh, except I didn't change the name, but for our course site, I actually had a program for all our network for all the different link connections on the website. This is what our website looks like from it. It's very complicated, but anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay, here's a problem. Let's see if this is traversable. And then I want to do one in the book. I did counts already. You can see how many of these vertices are odd. So this one's traversable. Now, we're going to do one together in the book. Would you please open to page 566? You're going to see a network, a network drawn there. That's uh, that's a long story, but that's read the paragraph above. The city of New York is composed of five boroughs: Brooklyn, I'm sorry, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island, Randall's Island, and New Jersey, and they're connected by bridge tunnels in some cases, sometimes separate ways. There's lots of ways to get from, for example, New Jersey to Manhattan. Okay. Is that a traversable network? Now, if you were running a tour bus company, you probably would want to know that. So, take a few minutes, start counting the vertices. See what you get from counts, the vertices. New Jersey, did you get a six? Staten Island, four. What do you get for Man Manhattan? Nineteen, yeah. Bronx, twelve. Randall's Island, three. Brooklyn, Queens, did you get ten? How many odds? Two. It's actually traversable, isn't it? So you could set up a tour that went through all of those exactly once and came back to the beginning and you know stuff like that okay now I got to show you what to do with these floor plans like on the bottom of page 566 so here we go actually this is a problem in the book and let me do a little erasing here Okay, you're going to see these like, I don't know what else, these kind of look like floor plates. Now, I put in the, the red. I put, are those in the book? Yeah, those notches are in there. These are like what? Doors. Okay? Doorway. So there's a way to get from, it's almost like bridges. There's a way to get from D to E directly, A to, a to D, and so forth. And so you're supposed to find out if that's traversable. You really need to first make network drawing. And so here's how you do it. Make a point for each room. So down below, So 
making a point for each room. And you need one more. You need one that represents the outside. Like outside the house is considered a place or a room. Now, question, where can you go from room A? You can go directly to D. You can also go outside. Where can you go from room D? To A or to E? Guess my E didn't get made, did it? I'm uh, I'm running out of voice voice gas here, so I don't know. From um, E, you can go to B. You can also go to, I guess, to the outside. So I'm going to come around this way. But you don't want to set up paths that cross other ones, okay? And remember, it's okay if they're not straight. So. Where can you go from room B? Outside. You can also go to room C. And I already have the E. From C, you can go to F. From F, you can go to the outside. So, oh, did I miss any? Why doesn't the go directly to the outside? Uh, there, we, there's no doorway from D to the outside. So I'm, I'm judging. See, like here, A does because there's an outside door. Let's see. So let's do a count. See what you get. Uh, missed B. Looks like we have two odd vertices, so therefore this is traversable. So, what I'm trying to tell you is when you get one of these, uh, I guess you could call a uh, floor plan problem, you need to translate it into a network. Remember, you have to add a room, it's kind of a room for the outside, otherwise it won't work. Then connect your network, run your counts, check what Euler says, put your answer down, smile. Um, is that the same one we just did? I think so. I just don't feel like I have the gas for non-Euclidean geometry, so I'll maybe save that for next time. So now, here's what I'd like you to do is start the assignment. So here's what we're going to do. Um, So it's 1 to 35 odds. So right now, you could do 1 through 19 odds. The eventual assignment is going to be 1 to 35 odds, but we can only go up to 19. OK? Hey, have have a good one. <clears throat> Drive safely. Some of you long trips to go. Yeah, I'm going. Where are you headed?
Hanging around, we got uh, family coming over. It'll be good. Oh yes. Well, enjoy your your weekend. Thank you. You too.